to work properly. And that's really important that you do. <laughs> you guys are quite close. Aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> this is how you get it's the, the only, it's the only <laughs> time we are. Trust me. <laughs> um, so, um, anyhow, so we'll go. We'll run through all, the, all that stuff as we're going along. So let's start with float lining. So, okay, welcome along tonight. So float lining. Um, hey, it, what it means is a lot of people say I oh, do use floats, so you don't use any floats at all. It's about getting your bait down as slow as you can and present it to the snapper. And those biggest snapper, sometimes they're on the bottom, yeah, they are, but generally speaking, they're up higher. They're in the, probably the bottom third of the water column. Thanks, thanks Ms. Okay. Bottom third of the water column. And, um, and they will hit your bait, say you're in 40 metres deep, they'll probably hit it from around about 28 metres and down. The, if you're in 40 metres deep, probably the, the strike, main strike zone is gonna be between about 33 and 38 metres, okay? That's, so you've got to try and time your line if you're drifting to be uh, in the strike zone of the boat at that given point of time. Um, but I'll we'll show you how to do that as well. So we'll start off with the gear, then we'll show you how to do it. So gear, okay. Um, you can use as light as a flathead rod for snapper. Um, and this is sort of, this is one of my own rods, um, but we do have combos which we do tonight as well on, de on deals, but... Um, so this is like a 4,000 size reel. I've got a uh, 20 pound braid on there, which is only PE1. This is a very, very thin, it's like 10 pound braid. I use a flat fish as well. Um, and I'm running 30 pound fluorocarbon leader, um, a little Lumo sinker, normal sinkers are fine, and a couple of 5 hooks that are snelled together. Um, and that's the sort of rig I like to use um, when, I'm, when I'm fishing for flat line for snapper. So two hooks. You can see those, I'm a bit hard down the back, sorry guys. And a very light sinker. Now that sinker depends on two or three different things. One is the wind, the current, and the other thing is um, the size of the line you're using. So um, if I step up to my next heavier one, which is this fella here, which is just a little bit heavier. So it's an older 4,000 size dive. It's actually like about 6,000 in a real these, size, these days. Um, and I've got, I think it's uh, the older, like 30 pound braid, which is like a P3 these days, it'll be nearly 60 pound because line's got so thin the last few years, or two years, so. Um, my lead on there's still only 30 pound. My hooks are the same size, but I've upped the sinker size. It's a lot bigger sinker. So it's about probably three times the size of this rod. The reason being, um, because that line's a lot thicker. So it needs, it'll still fall the same rate, it just needs to be able to pull it off, off the reel here. Okay, so a lot of people think they've just put the same size sinker on every different outfit, and one's going down really nice, and the other one's just sitting there and it's hardly coming off the spool, and that rod's just wasted. You might get a, you might get a bonito on there or something, um, that's mid border, but you'd be lucky to snap on it. So that's important to understand the sinker size, and that's the braids side of it or the line side of it. If you're using a, um, uh, a mono line. How many guys here use mono for snapper? Okay, any of you guys using bait runners? No, okay, so if you're using bait runners, um, my suggestion is to use mono. Um, so this type of outfit here, which is a um, very popular outfit we sell, and they got got uh, 20 pound mono on that. 20 pound yeah, mono, 20, yeah. yeah, 300 meters of 20 pound mono. So with a bait runner, does anyone not know what a bait, does anyone? Not know what a bait runner is. Okay, a few of you probably don't, so don't be shy. I'll tell you how it works. So, um, so we're talking about the gear, guys, so I'm gonna show you how to do it. So with the bait runner, what happens is, let's pull a bit of line off here. So you have your normal drag setting on the front here, right? And when the fish hits, it's gonna pull the line off. Um, but whilst, if you're, thanks, Graham. If you're fishing and you've thrown it out and um, it's going down, and once it gets down in the zone, you can then pull this lever back on the back here, and that, it actually disengages the spool. So it's, it comes off as easy as just coming off with the bar arm open. But um, the beauty of it is it's all intact. So if that fish starts just running, 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 runs hard, it doesn't normally do it because I'm just running out. <laughs> Graham's a slow fish there, mate. <laughs> Oops, I've caught something. Sabotage. This is actually exactly what happens when a doggy goes fishing. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
Uh, so anyway, it's running. All I do is I click the handle and instantly the drag is locked in. So it's like a dog on a chain running, chasing something, it's, it stops, right? Um, it's the same deal. And you can adjust the flow rate of that at the back with this little lever makes it tighter or makes it looser. Okay. And you don't actually have to drag on the front of that. No, it's preset. That's right. That's done. So it's, it's preset. So you need obviously not set it too tight because if it's running and you hit it, it'll snap the line. At the same, especially a big fish. But at the same time, um, you don't want to have too loose because it'll just keep going and you won't set the hook. So, but they're a very popular thing. Um, they're very popular on, on snapper. The one that didn't Victoria. Anyone Victorians here that used them down there at all? They're not going to hold you against it. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, that's a good question because the reason being is it comes off that way, right? And if it comes off that way and then that way, it twists the line. Um, you can use braid, but braid's very aggressive on a bait runner. So when you do the click over thing and you drag set anything near a little bit tight, it can pop the braid. So that's why we use mine, it's got stretch in it. So the delay is enough to make it work really well. It's just a really popular snapper outfit. That style of thing. Do you cast out when you're like, yeah, 100%. Out, you, yeah. Down yeah, correct. So that's the second part of the equation is, it, so we've got the sinker size sorted out with the braid size, we sort of know how far it's going to sink. Um, then the next thing is how far we're going to drift and, to get it down to the bottom, are we going to cast it out and then it never, it's not going to get to the bottom, or um, whatever it might be. So if, we're talking about drift fishing now. So if you are um, drifting, say, from the other days by on Wesley, say, drifting to the east, right? So I'll try and cast the nearly the distance of the depth, about three quarters, actually, the, the perfect amount. So if you're in, say, 50 metres deep, you want to try and do about a 35 to 40 metre cast, because what happens is... Um, as, and you leave the bar arm open. So you're talking spin reels here. So um, the reason why you do a little bit shorter than the depth is because the, there's a bit of line comes off, this, it just pulls off the spool uh, while it's sinking. But if you, if you close the bale up, it, doesn't, it takes a lot longer to get down. It does, it's got inertia, which is trying to pull that line down, if that makes sense. But when it's free, it just falls where it is a lot easier. With the bait runner, I leave the bail arm open till I know I'm at the depth, and then I shut it and turn the bait runner on. Yeah, like I said before. Well, so I will try. Yeah, so that at that time I'm hoping to get a hit. At the same time as that all happening, by the way. <laughs> but um, if you cast uh, the distance or more than the distance, yeah. um, what happens is it tends to hit the bottom too quick, and uh, and you get a lot of um, vermin rock cods, whatever, annoying you, but that's right, but if it's um, just free falling at its own speed, but it needs to pull a bit along if it's not quite on the bottom, the fish will come up to it. Does that make sense? More natural. More natural, yeah, that's right. And I've, I know it's only you're talking like, this is like Pacific, but you're only talking like 10 or 20% of the depth difference, but it makes a big difference. Yeah. yeah. Does that all make sense? Guys, a little bit involved there, but <laughs> if you get that right, if you get that, so remember to cast about two thirds of the depth of the of the, of the distance. Yeah, the so direction. getting back exactly right. But as I was saying before, if I'm if I'm drifting to that way, I'm going to cast that way. Um, don't cast directly in front of the boat because it always gets caught around the prop or around the transducer or something. Cast it just on a little bit of an angle, maybe 15 degrees, one that way and one that way, and they'll both come down normally the right way. But do you generally drift, Doug, or do you yeah, lock up I um, if there's not much current, um, I'll spot lock and I'll even burly up a bit. Yeah. Um, but I just find, I, I just get more fish drifting, you get more more coverage and you know that fish there might not be biting where you just spent 15 minutes on spot lock hoping they're going to come in the bite, trying. Um, but you, if you drift, you, you're definitely going to maybe find the fish in that 15 minutes. Does that make sense? And then maybe go back and spot lock, but always start drifting. Unless you know your spot really well, and you know exactly that time of the year and that, that tide and everything, it's going to work. And then 100% spot lock because it's going to be, it'll fire again normally. In the old days, we used to anchor up and burly like mad. And yes, to get into. correct. And it still works as, these days too. Um, the problem is at the moment this year, we've had a lot of northerly current and um, they just don't want to know about it. They just, 
a multi current, it's like a, uh, it's like a negative current. <laughs> so when you got subtly current, the fish are happy and they're on the bite. Yeah. When you got nordly current, they're yeah. they're very slow to get unmotivated, and it's still going to the north. So has anyone noticed how the last few times they've been out, it's going that way instead of that way? It's going uphill. Um, I haven't seen this long. It's been set, uh, five months now. It's been running north. I haven't seen it for my life. Five days maybe, but not five months. Uh, it doesn't matter. It, the 50s occasionally comes into the south out there, but the 50 fathoms that is. But uh, in close, it's been predominantly north forever, mm. as far as I know. Yeah. So yeah. Your sinkers, you had a free running sinker there, and you've got a swivel on there. Uh, swivel on. That one on the uh, This one? Yes. Uh, this one. Free running. Uh, this one here is because Jake done that up today for us. Yeah, this is not my one. My one's at home, actually. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I don't know why I put a swivel on there. Oh, I know why. It's because just because it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's mono to mono. So yeah. mono to mono, you can do an all bright, but it's not. It's not. It's a bit chunky. So a swivel would probably be better in that case. Yeah. So Braid to mono. Is you, the idea with the sinker to have it? Uh, you know, okay. So if you get sinker too far up the line, too far up here. It always tangles up, guys. It's just a, it's just the way it is. It gets tangled up. Um, if you keep your sinker down on the on the hooks, it still can happen, but it's a lot less chance. The because what you do is you cast it up. Just imagine your sinker is going to go um, probably sink faster than the bait, and the bait is going to come up and get wrapped around sometimes. Um, the objective is to get that bite before it gets time to tangle up. Um, but uh, swivel is up to you guys if you want to use it or not. Uh, personally, if I'm using braid, I'd never use a swivel. Um, mono to mono, those you can use it if you want. Yeah. Um, leader size. So people ask what size leader I use. Doesn't matter if I'm using 50 pound braid or using um, 10 pound braid. If I'm fishing in close, like I'm talking under 65 meters, I only use 30 pound. Doesn't matter how heavy my braid is, my line is. You gotta use 30 pound and fluorocarbon. Um, the reason being, it, it's just, it's tough enough, even for some of the big, I've been dusted by big, big snapper, but it's generally enough. Um, and it makes your bait present better in the fall. Um, obviously fish don't see fluorocarbon supposedly. And um, it just seems to be enough. It seems to be enough. If I get 50 or 60, I get a lot of twist. If I go, uh, in, in mono, I get a lot of twist. I get a lot of twist with fluorocarbon too, but because it's so stiff, it holds itself better. And it sinks faster. Yes, mate? Is it true that snapper are fussy on what size leader? Yeah, that's why I use 30 pounds. 30 or 30. <laughs> <laughs> if, if, if I'm out wider though, so the, uh, the fish, I've always believed fish in close are educated. I don't know how it works, but they seem to, <laughs> they, they seem to be clever. The fish out on the 50 fathom reef, the snapper out there, I don't really give a damn. So you can use 40, 60 pound leader, but it doesn't, it doesn't affect your fishing too much. It's just, that's what I'm saying, inside of 70, in 36 fathoms and in, um, stick with 30, even out on 36 fathoms, you know. Um, the only time I'll change it is when the fish are, the bigger fish are biting, and they don't really care either. It's just those little sort of 39 to, 55, 60 centimetre ones seem to be a little bit fussy. Yeah, the big ones, they generally know they're going to bust you off, they don't really care. So, <laughs> um, we've been out there and caught um, one day, was my brother Paul and brother Pete and sister Helen that works here. I think we got four or five fish around a metre that day. Yeah, it's down the 18th at the front end, it's a few years ago. Um, but um, that day we started off with 30 pound, as we always do. And I think we ended up with 100 at the end. And, and it wasn't until we got to about 80 or 100 that we actually saw a fish. We lost lots. So we just kept on upping, 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 upping. And we upped our lines too, of course. Um, so in that case, the, when they're biting hard, it doesn't matter. But generally as a rule, like at the moment with the northerly current and things are a bit fussy, um, I'd say stick with 30. It's enough. Um, Sorry, Pete? What, what about the length of the leader? Yeah, good question. Um, it, okay, this is a hard one too, because a, a lot of rods have very small guides, right? And when you cast through them, you get Sometimes it hooks up and your line goes, your bait goes tung out the other side, your sinker goes that way. Um, so in that scenario, uh, I try and keep my, my leader about a metre and I try and cast with the leader not outside the rod and it never gets tangled. Yeah, you, you eliminate that process. 
Um, so a metre, is that enough? I, I think uh, for most of fish it is, but those big ones, no, it's not. They'll take it into the, into the crevices, whatever, and break you off. But when you lose a couple, you get dusted a couple of times, it's always a debatable thing. Would I, if I had to put heavier line down, would have I got that fish? Would have I got that bite? I don't know, you know. It's a chance to get a take. I'd rather fish light, get lots of bites and lose the odd fish. Then um, sit there and wait and hopefully a big one's going to jump on there, you know. So it makes uh, no difference to <coughs> the bite. So I can see the brain. Oh, okay, no, no. So length doesn't make a difference. Okay. They don't care. No, not normally. A meter's enough. I think they're looking at the bait. They're not looking at the line up there, you know. Yeah. The, a meter's enough, I think, yeah. I reckon it makes a difference. I run on three meters. Uh, Stewie anyway. runs long and light. And but, light, 16. But he fishes 10 pound leader for snapper. Uh, 16. <laughs> 16. 16. 16. Yeah, it's so, just the by running a longer leader like fluorocarbon, as Dougie said before, yeah. it sinks. You can fish lighter sinker again. Mm. I think it just makes it sink a lot more natural. It's probably an, but, an added feature to get your line down easier. Yeah, having a bit of weight, but yeah, but yeah, thirty pound one meter. Yeah, because you've got a lot of line to play with. Yeah, that's right. I've got plenty of leader though. Cut a little bit off. Start again. Yeah, that's it. Exactly. Right. Oh. Uh, <laughs> You don't have to tie, tie a new braid to the left. Try, try both ways, guys. See how you go. <laughs> and that, that is true, though. If you run long leader that's on, on your reel, you'll generally have a good cast as well. Um, sometimes if you don't wind that first bit of line on, when you're winding up your bait real quick and just quickly that line knot goes on, and then you've got a bit of line on top of that, obviously it's two or three metres long, you get a few turns on there. That If there's a loop there, it may catch on the way out. That's the only downfalls too, is that right? I tie, a I tie a little knot, so it's all right. <laughs> <laughs> I think the biggest thing is if you're going to try that long leader, you need to tie an FG or something like that. Yeah, like okay. an yeah. all bright or a double uni just doesn't cut it. It's mm. going to clang on every guide like Dougie mm. was saying before. Mm. I think yeah. the FGs, I mean the FGs still get hung up. Yeah, they... Occasionally. Yeah. Not as occasionally. much, but yeah. yeah, occasionally they do. That's definitely. How do you solve the problem of the sinker going up the line then? Yep. And twisting on the way down. Yep, that's exactly what we were talking about earlier. You yeah. can't do that. You can't do any much about it other than ho hopefully um, hoping for a quick bite on yeah. the way through. So it doesn't have much time to do that. Yeah. Um, I like it, it, the sinker may equalise the drop. Yeah. It, I normally just uh, chuck a little float stopper or something above yeah. the sinker. You can, yeah, I was going to say put a, even, even yeah. a tight bead on there. Yeah, so, yeah. Mm. yeah just above it. Just a silicon stopper, a little clear one. Yeah. yeah, we saw them see. They're like float stop a bead. Yeah. So you thread your line through that first. Yeah. And put it on the line first, actually, you've got to pull it on the line. Put your sinker on, then tie your um, your two snell hooks. Yeah. And then the sinker will only go up to that point. Yeah. 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 And it's, it's very, very small, like a rice bead, uh, rice yeah, size, yeah, grain size. Yeah, it just keeps yeah. it all a bit together. Yeah, I didn't bring any up tonight, down. sorry. But um, yeah. yeah. Cool. So, you know, Different to New time. Zealand. Yeah, like, <laughs> yeah, like we always, you know, just had a swivel. Yeah. And you put your bloody thing on, sink yeah, yeah. on, whatever. Yeah, yeah. And I would use mono to mono or braid to mono and mm. it didn't bloody matter. But no. this is why we come in here because yeah. it's a winner. Yeah, it's, I know, it's, it's different. you got to do here. I yeah. know. Well, one different time, fishing. Yeah. One time I was in New Zealand, real quickly, they were using 200 pound, I think it's 150 to 200 pound leader, like a uh, black magic about a 10 o hook. And it was rusty, and a um, bonito head. But we're catching, you know, fourteen kilo snapper. They were monsters, yeah. and uh, I couldn't believe the. I said, "Why? Why are you using such a heavy leader?" I got, I'm, I've got like my forty pound leader. He was like, "Put that away," you know. And I said, "Why? Why are you using such heavy?" He goes, I just to stop the um, the barracuda from biting it off." He said, "Is a barracuda the fish the with the big teeth?" And, and it's a cuda. Yeah. Or, 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 yeah, yeah. yeah. And then he said, um, um, but they don't care. They don't care about the size of the leader. Diff mate, Gold Coast fish don't care. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. 30 pound or 30 pound. That's it. But we have the 50s, 50 pounds, 60 pounds, fine. Okay. Um, hook size. Next thing. What size hooks do I use? It depends on the bait you're going to use. So your average pilly, um, I'll quickly put one of these on a bait for you. The average pilly, um, which is hard to get good pillies at the moment, by the way. Um, is around that sort of size. So I look at it and I think, well, a 6.0, 7.0 is going to be too big. Um, I'd be using a 5.0 or a 4.0. Is a 4.0 big enough for a, a big snapper? Hell yes, plenty, 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 plenty. 
You only use the light line, you use a light leader. There's no way the hook's going to bend, especially the good hooks we've got these days. Um, sorry? Circle the hook? Uh, no, it's a J hook, like an octopus style kit, drip on the uh, Octopus style, yeah. Circle hook on the Pat Noster, uh, but uh, uh, suicide hooks. Yep, octopus hooks. Um, so 4050 is fine. So when you look at, you know, people say, oh, that's not big enough, or whatever. And you, I don't know if you guys jig with ball jigs. Those hooks are like size six. And you catch an eight kilo snapper on those and they get hooked to the lips. You don't, the hook's not that bad. It's plenty big enough. So don't stress about having too small a hook. Um, but when you're using a live bait, something like that type of thing, then I'd stick an eight on it. It's all about the hook matching the bait and not being too obvious in the bait. So if you've got a, a pilcher like that and got an ADO and it's going to be fairly big, right? It's, again, it's presentation and, and they don't want to know about it. It's, it's big hooks hanging out of the side, sticking out 15 mil to one side of it. It doesn't work. So 4050 hugs it, small, nice, um, and it just seems to work really well. I don't you need to add to that. Strip. No, about, yeah, 4050. Yeah. I think a hook's better being a little bit too small than a little bit too big. I'll um, just do a couple of rigs up here. So none of you guys asked about gang hooks yet, um, but gang hooks work really well on floaters as well, okay? And um, in the gang hook sizing, I'd probably use around about 4Os or 5Os uh, in the size. They, they seem to hug the body nicely on the pilcher as well. Um, they're strong enough if you get a Kobe, grab it or something like that, um, you'll, you'll, get it, you'll get it in. Um, hooks and swivels are really good too but make sure the hooks are not too long. So remember your normal type tailor type hooks. If you put like, um, say you normally use five hooks, but if you put, and three five hooks on a pilch is perfect, but if you put three five O's of swivels in between, it's too big on most pilchers. It doesn't fit. You gotta go down to four O's, or even three O's to make it fit. So it can't be too big on the pilch. So how do you put a pilch on a couple of snail hooks? These ones are very, very close, but that's okay. These are those, has anyone used these like silicon type rigs yet at all? They're really good. Um, so they're a bit like a, a ball squid jig with us, um, um, yeah, like a squid octopus, octo jigs. Um, we use a snapper, but without the ball on it. So we're using the sink as the ball, so a little bit different sort of thing. But they're also a slide style, so this is also a slide style, it goes up and down the line. And um, it's that sort of dancing around, flapping around of the skirt that really gets them going. They come in all different colours. Um, I know you guys down the back can't see this, but um, there's a couple of different ways of putting this, the hooks on. One is you can go through the body around here, pull the whole thing through, dig it back through the other side. Um, some guys will just stick it through here, but a lot of time the, the hook ends up sticking out like that in the pilchard, and I think that's not the best thing to do. Um, to secure it, you can either just go in and not quite <coughs> through to halfway and just sit the, the hook out like that to the side. Can you all see that? I oh, can't sit down the back, but I'll pass this around a moment, guys. And then the first hook, um, because obviously it's a dead fish, I just put it through the top of the pilcher. When you put it through the top, you need to hold the, this bottom part here because when you push it through, it'll actually snap it. Then the hook head sticks out from the pilcher and will spin on the way down again, they don't like it. So you've got to keep it all, presentation is really important. So just push it through, pop it out. And away we go. Oops. Put my glasses on, it be better. <laughs> Done a million times, but, um, but that's sort of how it looks. So I'm just going to pass this around and just try not to pull up too much so the next guy can get a chance at seeing how it works. Get the skirt down. It's caught up. Sorry, Stu. <laughs> That's it. Dinner is served. Um, so I put a gang hook on, guys. So this is a dress gang hook. Has anyone used this type of thing yet at all? Do you find it pretty good? Yeah, they're really good. They are really good. No, the slimy really well. Yeah, slimy, pillies, anything like that. Um, they do have swivels in between. So, um, like, no one's asked again, is swivels better than non-swivels? I'd say, yeah, they are better. Um, so particularly if you get like pearlies and stuff like that spins on the way up, because they'll just actually, they won't leverage the hook out. They can't like, pop it out internally, that they'll spin with it, right? And more chance of holding fish on the hook. Uh, but really, really good. So when I put a gang hook on, we've done this on YouTube, but um, 
First thing I do is I measure out the distance of the hook versus the length of the, the last hook here. So these ones are actually 7 O's or 5 O's. They're a little bit big for, the, for this because it comes up past its head here, but we'll give it a crack. So I'll start right down the bottom. When I put a pilchard on, and I can't sit in the back, but I hold my uh, index finger and my middle finger um, and I leave a gap in between the two and that's where the hook goes down through and I push down on the hook with my thumb. So push up, push down. So the hook goes in here and I sort of push through because otherwise you stab yourself with the hook, right? Come back around. Booty of pilchers is they've got a dotted line there for you to put the, the hook through. That's where you put the hook through, on the dotted line, okay? <laughs> I reckon we've invented that in school, they were fishermen. Got off pilchers. And then the last hook's gonna go through the eye, and that's it. And that's how it's presented. I just wanna push that in there. Nice and neat, very quick and very easy. Should be able to do it in the dark. But guys, start using a bit of, a fair bit of tassel type stuff. It's, it is really, uh, enhances your fishing probably, I don't know, 50% straight? Mm. Yeah, need all the help you can get. <laughs> Some people do. <laughs> well, he can use two ones at once. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yep. So yeah, they're good. So um, this little one here, um, it glows blue. Okay. Now I know you're only fishing 20, 30, 40 meters deep, um, but it still makes a difference. You know, you can see glow in sunlight. You can see you can see stuff glowing. As soon as you get a little bit of dark, the spectrum changes. It becomes highly visible. Um, when they're UV, they become even more visible, apparently, to the fish. don't know. I didn't ask them, but someone did. But um, they love UV stuff, and they love blue colour. So um, glow blue is very hard to find, very hard to get, but these things are glow blue. Um, I'll just... Uh, might. So, uh, Kev, is it? So is the glasses there, mate? Do you mind hit that light switch just there, my friend? Do you mind? Just don't trip over on the way back. <laughs> Cheers, matey. Um, is there a light switch on there at all? No, it's a different one. I don't oh, know. Different one. Okay. Uh, that, oh, look at the. Yeah, mate, you're onto it. Okay. So, <laughs> you can see that just a little bit glowing, right? As I say, you can sort of just see it. Um, but if you use a UV torch, um, which is a blue light, they are extremely fast to charge something up. So, I'm just gonna try and find the switch on here. There it is. Okay. <laughs> it's a blue light. So if I just put this on here, just. Wave it over, like one run down along it like that. Can you see that out close, please? It's very, very quick. And, um, and that's how good they are. If, same as these skirts before, that green one that's going around before. That's the green skirt. It's, it's going to grow green, but yeah, green's better than, um, than nothing glowing. And you can see that there. And then I'll just show UV, how UV works. So. That's orange. If you hit the torch, it's going to be orange, but it's not going to be UV orange. But you hit it with um, UV torch. You see how bright it is? Okay. So that's supposedly what turns them on. They, they see what we can't see, but they see it. Well, I don't know how they found that out, but they did. Um, but anyhow, yeah, so that's how UV works. And same with those hooks. These are glow hooks. So... You see that? So... Um, yeah, they're really good too. Anyhow, um, we'll do more UV stuff later. Yeah, UV's, UV everywhere. <laughs> yeah, sinkers as well. Actually, while we've got the lights off, I'll show you a couple other things, guys. Does anyone use glow beads? I'll just do it one more time. Sorry, mate. Does, thank you for that, though. Does anyone use glow beads on their deep... I oh, like their just bottom dropping fish for pearlies and stuff. And do you guys find that it enhances your fishing? Not too bad. You're probably going to try it differently without or with, I guess. Um, but it definitely does. And in, in the bead world, um, there's the standard type beads, which is just like this little green one there. And I can't see down the back, guys, but I'll quickly charge it up for you. And there's all there's beads and there's beads. Okay, So that glowed not too bad. You can see that charged up with the thing. Then I'll show you these ones here. So these ones here are glowing already without even charging them yet. So these are the most glow in the world. They're soft bead and they're like a little fish shape that, and they've got a cone concave end that goes over the, the hook eye or over whatever you're using, sink, it doesn't matter. 
Um, but I'll just show you these things here. These are like a little concave bullet head. Yeah. A few in here, so just, uh, but I think you can see how, how bright they are. They're very, very bright. And um, that's the most glow. When we do turn the lights off at night time in the shop here, there's glow stuff everywhere. And, uh, <laughs> and, but they are ridiculous. And now there's a guy doing sinkers. Um, and you can see how quick that UV torch works. See that? Like, if I turn that around there like that, hit that, you see that? It's ridiculous. But they just, everything's glowing. And then there's blue sinkers coming out too that's glows like a semi sort of bluey green colour. But blue is by far the most um, popular colour to use for, for fishing. We use it all the time. Um, but green's not too bad as well. But those little skirts before, those little, these little fellows here, they are the, they're the gun. And getting back to your skirt question. Thank you so much, mate. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, no, the sun's enough. The sun's enough. But, but if you're fishing in the deeper water, like say 100 metres plus, yep. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Cheers, mate. I'm gonna uh, flick that switch, my friend. Thank you, sir. Thanks for doing that. Well done, mate. Sorry. Very quick. Oh, you did that? <laughs> you were a quick learner. Um, so, um, I was about to say that I forgot what it was. Um, anyhow, do you use a skirt above your pilly? You don't have to, but if you want to, it definitely, I believe, enhances the fishing again. But thank you. But some days it, it, um, it becomes a pain in the ass because it just gets tangled up too much. You know, it's rough, windy days, whatever it might be, and it's a joggly, whatever. Um, yeah, you've got to try it. But getting back to what we were saying before, our rigs are the sinkers. Sink size depends on the current and the wind drift. Um, anything from a little tiny pea sinker up to, you know, if I'm fishing out the 50 fathoms and a bit of wind, I'll use a nine ball, which is a big sinker. Huge. Um, or, an, or an eight ounce barrel to get me down to the bottom in 100 metres deep for snapper. Um, if I'm uh, fishing out the 50s, the only time I change my leader from 30s, I'll jump up to about a 50 pound uh, fluorocarbon. That's as heavy as I use fluorocarbon after it twists. Really bad. So it's alright if you're trolling it, but if you're bottom fishing with more than 50 pound uh, fluorocarbon, it twists up really bad, okay? There's one uh, way to one length the leader is that it gets... Twists. This fluorocarbon. Yeah, um, and that's probably all I need to tell you. But the hook size out, out on the 50s, so I'm using pilly still. I'm still going to stick with five O's. Okay. Um, if I'm going to use a slime or something, I might jump up to six or seven. Are the fish bigger on the 50 fathom reef compared to in close? I'd say no. The biggest fish are in close. Uh, consistency of bigger ones out there is definitely true, uh, but the biggest fish are, are right in close. And my biggest snapper have always been under 50 meters. Or 52 meters, so you don't need a big boat to catch a big snapper. Yeah, what about you, Stu? No, all of mine are being pretty close to yeah, 18s, yeah. 24s. Yeah. yeah, yeah, So the big ones come in every year. That uh, generally now is June, July. July is by far my favourite month to catch the snapper out the fronty. Um, but they will be here now, and they're already starting to rock up. The water temperatures dropped very quick this year, so it's only like 20 or 21 out there at the moment. Um, and they really like that. When it gets down to about 19, that's like the prime time, which is probably about July. Okay. Um, also, 18 up in the boat, Yes, yeah, it's, it's in close. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it was only 15 in the canal the other day. Very cold. Um, any questions on that so far? Is that any time of the day? Before? No, that's a good question. Um, bite time, no. So, uh, this is a really debatable one again. If the. This weekend's a perfect tide. So this weekend you've got double whammy bite period. So you've got uh, high tide just after daylight. So you get a bite time right on daylight. Um, and then, but if it's sort of like halfway in tide on daylight, which I was last weekend, it's, it's not really the best. Um, or last the run out, whatever it might be. If you coincide then the next, always after a high tide, two hours after, and then two hours after that. So for the, the middle of the high tide, I uh, run out tide, sorry is like the, the best bite time of any time of the day. But just by coincidence, this weekend it's around about sort of eight to 10 in the morning, which is a good time. So the sun's in the right position, it's not quite right up high, and the bite time's perfect. So 
um, that's why it's showing two of the three fish this, this weekend, because it all marries up. And then um, you'll get low tide, and then you get the first to run in tide bite, which will be mid-afternoon, and then you'll get that high tide bite again just after dark. So it's a, nearly a full day bite cycle. Sunday is anyhow. Mm. Uh, Saturday's not far behind it. Tomorrow, is anyone going fishing tomorrow? Yeah, well, well done. I was hoping to go tomorrow, but <laughs> we got too much on. <laughs> but anyhow, we sacrificed. Um, but um, tomorrow is a little bit quiet in the morning, but then about um, midday, 11 o'clock, yeah, it, starts it, to it starts to rip in. The, the fish start popping up and everything starts getting good. Yeah, so you might get a bite. We get a high tide thing tomorrow about 6.30. Or six, um, so it's a really good tide in the morning, um, and then you'll probably get another bite about eight o'clock. Yep. Um, getting back to biting bite period times during the day, if that high tide's at midday, and I would say they're going to definitely come to bite about two o'clock. It's two hours after high tide. If it's high tide at ten, I'd say definitely come start at twelve. I know it's the middle of the day. It would never be as good as the, as the morning bite if you get like this weekend. That time's the perfect time. Um, but it definitely works, mate. And it doesn't matter what you're doing, flatted, brim, um, snapper, deep dropping, it's all the same. It, it's just amazing how it works. Mm. Like we're out deep dropping last week and the bite time was two in the afternoon at 2.30. And they did say a minor bite period about 10 o'clock. We did get a couple of pearlies and stuff around 10 and they went quiet and exactly at 2.30, it all hell broke loose and everyone was catching fish and it was going off. And it was right through to five o'clock till we come home. So was it only on bait or did you guys use Well jigging and, jigging and bait both, didn't matter, yeah. Yeah. They just when the bite periods on they'd bite. Yeah. And, so, as, and that was exactly two hours after high tide too, by the way. Yeah. So big big believer of it. <laughs> but one thing I, I hate, I, I don't like fishing um, the full moon day, which unfortunately is on Sunday, even though they're showing a few fish. Um, it's a great nighttime bite, but I just find it's just, it, it's either hit and miss. Some days I just don't want to know about it. Why is that so? Because I'm a big believer of the moon in the sky. Even so, when the um, full moon is obviously in the sky at night time, so the nighttime fishing is the best. When it sets in the morning, that they'll switch off a little bit. Um, but in another sort of week's time, you've got that, um, the moon becomes later in the day, so it'll be, the moon will go down like midday. And that'll be that uh, sort of high tide about 10 in the morning, if it goes out at midday. And um, you'll get the high tide and then the two hours after to midday, bite period sort of starting. Um, then the moon will set and then it'll go quiet again. And I don't know how the fish know it, but they do know it. Definitely they know it. They know the moon, how it works. And when you get the new moon, which is like when we were at the other day, um, the moon can be in the sky for a lot of time during the day. It's dark moon, so you don't, you just see the, the silhouette. but some days they can bite nearly all day that, that period as well. And as soon as the moon goes down, uh, it, it they go off the bite. Or like the other day, that didn't come up till 10 or 11 o'clock. Yeah. The minor bite was when the moon rose. We got a little bit of a bite and it definitely makes a, a big difference. So if you've got Windy on your phone, the Windy app, um, and you can actually click on the area you want to go fishing at, see the weather, um, but it'll, it'll show the little fish symbols. Has anyone seen that yet? Yep, so you click on the you click on the spot where you want to go to. Roughly you get so so I click on say fifty fathom reef where I am gonna be off jumping pin area. Then I click on the little line that says what the wind's doing. Click on that and then it brings up a chart down below and you see the little fish on there. It'll go a skinny little fish or there'll be like three fish or whatever's biting. And you'll see the progression during the day from zero to twenty-four hours. When that fishing bite enhances it gets better. It's, so, it's very accurate. Like, I'm not saying it's 100%, but it's probably 80%. It's pretty good. It's the difference between, okay, it's like last few days if you went out and didn't have much luck, it looks so good, the weather's so good, the swell's not big, everything's on my side, but the fish aren't. <laughs> so I go out there and I haven't looked at the fish bite time or the bite chart and I'm inspecting it and this happens to us sometimes too because you don't get, don't get a chance to get out very often and you make the most of it when the weather's good. And you get out there and it's a, it's a crapper. They just don't bite. That's because it's a little skinny fish on that day <laughs> and they just will not bite no matter where you are. So, but if you went out and looked at it and think, okay, next, um, I, you, I, we plan ahead. So we'll look at, say, okay, next week on Monday, 
it's a it's a good fish bite day, right? Just pretending. And then the weather's crap, but you can see Monday actually not does not too bad. Then we won't go fishing on Saturday or Sunday. We'll try and get the Monday to get out there because we're we're gonna have a good time. And that's why we, we get a lot of fish sometimes because we we work on that theory. I'll share it with you guys. <laughs> yep. Okay. Any questions on that at all, folks? Okay, finding the, finding the snapper. We're talking about float line at the moment. Um, this is where you've got to learn to read the sounder properly. This is really important, guys. So some days, or I must admit, some days we've caught fish and not even seen anything on the sounder. It's like they just can't find them. Drop down, they're just biting their heads off. Um, I don't know if they're hiding amongst the rocks or where, what they're doing. Um, but other days you've got fish over sound, you see the snapper, you know the snapper's bait there, the snapper on it, um, and they just don't bite. Again, it's probably the bite period, perhaps, um, or I don't know what it is, but it looks good on the sounder. And the last weekend was like that. But you guys who were out there might have seen what the good shows, you know, but they just weren't biting very well. So um, obviously, getting the bait down there's the first way you're going to find out if they're going to bite or not. So that's up to you how you want to how you want to do that. But um, my suggestion is to keep your sounder on split screen, um, one side zoomed into the bottom, say. Um, <laughs> I don't know, around a, a four and eight zoom. So if you're in 50 metres deep, you probably look at the bottom 15 metres. Okay? Um, if you just keep it on 50 metres, um, like something, like a, a snapper could be held on a rock the size of this table, you know? And that's all you see. If you're on 50 metres and you've got zero to 50 metres, it'll just be a, a pencil line, you won't see that rock. But if you zoom into 10 or 15 metres off the, bo off the bottom, it'll come up. It'll, you'll see it come up and you'll see more detail around it. So you must learn to zoom in. Zoom, zoom, more zoom. Okay. The next thing you want to do is you want to understand your drift pattern. So um, at the moment it might be blowing um, northerly. So you think, okay, I'm looking around my sound. I keep going up on, into the wind. Da, 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 da. And then you'll, um, you'll pull up wherever you're going to be and then you're going to drift back south. But... That's not the case. If there's a bit of if there's one knot of current to the north, it'll probably pull you against the wind. So you'll you stop there, the, the reef's back there, but you're actually drifting away for across the sand. You need to do a blind drift first. You need to pull up and just give yourself five minutes, get your bait ready, clear everything ready, and just have your track on and watch which way the track goes on the GPS. And then once you know which way you, you're going to go, um, then you look around and work out where the fish are and then and then calculate the distance you drifted in that five minutes to where you're gonna drift over your stuff. So there's no good again, if you're only drifting at like nothing, but there's a bit of wind or a bit of current, whatever it might be, um, and you're drifting at sort of point two of a knot and you overshoot the mark by 200 meters, you've blown probably 15 minutes to get to the spot that is very, very slow. And you get nothing, you might be getting grinners or terrible things. <laughs> so, I uh, wasted the, the, the six of the 12 pillars you got in your bait box. So <laughs> I was suggesting is to, um, as I said, do that blind drift and calculate how fast you're drifting. And if it means pulling up just 30 metres to the right of the rock, then that's where you stop. Because you're going to be slowly going to quickly get to that mark a lot quicker and not waste time or bait. Especially in the bite period times, it's so important that you make the van take advantage of it. Does that make sense? Okay, good. Basically, be one cast per drift. No, um, if I've got a long drift uh, and there's uh, quite a, so Graham's asked, do I do one one cast per drift? Um, some places, yes, if the drift's quite fast or the rock's quite small. Um, but generally, I try and get two or three casts in. And I'm running at if you run if you're fishing single, make sure you run at least two rods, if not three. Three is a bit hard to organise. Two is not too bad. Um, you need to be watching one while you're doing the other one. Um, then uh, what the, the trouble is we get a fish on, that one takes off, so you get the bail arm open, right, guys, and the fish hits it on the way down. My, my thing was in the zone, I'll quickly show you on here. So if that's the boat here, an ugly boat, um, and I've cast up to up front of the boat over here sort of thing, and my line's coming down, and that's my rod, right out the side of the boat there. Um, I want the, my line to be in this area here to get the bite, okay? It's got to be in that area there. 
Does that make sense? If my line's out the back here, um, I'm, and I haven't got a, if it's gone through that area and I haven't got a bite and there's a bit, quite a bit of drift on, it's getting quickly back to there, um, I will back up if I know there's reef still there. Um, and I try and, t once I work out, say so one drift, I know how fast I'm drifting, I try and even time my casting so that on my plotter, sorry, real quick. So this is my sounder screen. And um, just so this is a GPS over here. Sorry guys, a little skinny one. And this is my mark here. I got another mark here. And maybe another mark uh, here. And on my sounder, that looks a little bit like like that, and the fish are on here, and on here, and on here. Um, what I'll do is I'll stop, if there's not much, too much drift, I'm drifting that way. I'll stop around here, sorry guys over there. I'll stop around here, I'll cast up there, and by the time I get to around here, I'm hoping my line's in that area. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, if I don't get a bite and it's only another 30 metres across to there and say around about not even a minute, um, I'm drifting to that next pinnacle. Um, my line's now out like that. I won't sacrifice to know the line's very close to that mark there. And at that point there, I'll back the boat up and my line will be in the zone again. Does that make sense? Uh, and I might even wind a tiny bit of line up so I'm back and back, just to bring it back off the bottom and it has to fall back down again, just a little bit. Um, and hopefully I get a fish there. My other line, but while I'm doing that, if my other line um, is, well, I don't like backing up on two, it gets a bit messy if you're on your own. How many guys do you fish on their own? Quite a few of you probably do, I dare say. Um, if you've got two guys, it doesn't matter. It, the best thing is you must be the driver because you know exactly when to cast. Okay, the other guy just, good luck to you. It's true. <laughs> when, you get to, when you get to this position here and you've got that fish, um, I might have pulled my other line up and sacrificed, I pulled up out here, but I know as soon as I get there, that one's just come, about to come up, I'll quickly cast my other line out while that fish is pulling on my line or I'm about to pull it up. Um, I'll throw that line back out again, and I know by the time I get that fish up, again, that, that line there is in that zone again, and hopefully the next one goes off. And you've got to keep working it and understanding, you, you need to know the bottom. You need to know the bottom where you're fishing. Uh, and that's why it's really important that you understand reading your sound and GPS, and mark as much as you can on your screen. You should have, you should have drift patterns all over the joint where you're drifting across and little marks where the fish are. And, you, you can look at it and when you go straight over for one sound or across it next trip out, you know exactly where they are, exactly where to throw your line, you know exactly everything. And you should know that for thousands of spots. And you can go to any of those spots and just get them. It takes time, but if you've got nothing on your screen, except maybe, maybe your three marks, right? You don't know the last time you're out was my drift this way, because the wind's blowing that way now, which way do I go? But when I drifted that way, I might have put another mark down here, and I can see, I actually put a little start stop on my drift things, a little, little emblem, so I know exactly where to start my drift and stop, most times, depending on the current, of course, um, and I know exactly when to throw the line out to drop to fish as well. Yeah, so, up to you guys how much effort you put in, but the more effort you put in, the more fish you'll catch. And um, if you're going to bottom fish with the float line, so how many guys here throw a float line right out and then drop a bottom donger down at the same time? I do, I think most of you would probably do that. Um, so um, at this point here, you cast your rod up your floater or two floaters, and um, then the next thing you do is you drop your bottom one down because it's really quick. So it's going to hit the bottom, and normally the fish on that are pretty aggressive and a lot quicker to bite on it, where the float line takes ages to get down. Generally better fish, but um, this one, the bottom one's going to be quite quick. So again, it's all about timing with that as well. So you hopefully get a fish on that, pull it up before 
these lines get hit that are, that are drifting down in the area. It's really hard work. <laughs> it's not as easy. Mate, we are so busy. I don't have time to have a drink or to eat or anything. It's serious to say too. And it's not until we're driving home that we finally go, ah, and drink. <laughs> um, but I love it. That's good. Um, anyhow, so we've rigged up our pillies. Um, we've rigged up, um, uh, we've worked out the sinker size. And the, again, if, if you look at the apps, um, if you go to BOMB, they do a current current what the current's doing you can see if it's going north or south you can see if it's 0.8 of a knot or two 2.8 knots and that sort of designates when you rig up at home before you go out what's like sinking up on your line and you know with the braid that you're using what sinker works normally on that on that line and then you change your sinker size to, based on the current for that line as well so as i said but earlier today we talked about the two aspects of, of um, braid size and, and windage and current. So they all designate what size thing you're gonna do. Just have a shot at whatever you think it's gonna be and if you need to change it, do it out there. But I suggest not to do it out there when you get there. Have everything rigged up, ready to roll. And all you do is you just put the bait on and throw it out, okay? Um, you always using pilchards? Pilchards and squid. So pilchards always went on float lining. Look, I do use, um, uh, slimy fillets, yellowtail fillets, a butterfly yellowtail. I did it the other day as well, trying to coax something bigger. Just got pecked out by little ones. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, but pilchers just seem to be the happy snapper bait. Yep. Definitely, yeah. Um, bottom drop and rig, again, I'm using that sort of fluffy stuff. You know, you got one of these in your bag, I think. Uh, or two of them, two, two in a packet, like a box like that sort of thing. You'll see it in your, in your bag. Um, so these are really good, and um, again, I, I can't, I can't uh, give you enough emphasis on how much different having that to just a bear hook makes. So the bear hook's okay, if the fish are biting, I'll bite it. Um, bear hook with a bead is probably the next best thing, or a bit of, a bit of um, tube rigged up. Yeah, well, <laughs> you got to put the bait on as well, sorry. <laughs> And then next thing that works the best is, is like that type of thing there, which is again looks like a ball jig without the ball. Um, but in Pat Noster, they just smack it. And just a, um, if you're fishing under 24 fathoms, I'll say 50 metres, I'd run an 80 ounce sinker. Um, you don't need to run too light a sinker. Pat Noster actually works better with more weight than less weight. I don't know if you guys know that. Um, because the idea of it is that it needs to hold the line fairly tight on the bottom, but this part here is quite loose and that's what the fish really like. Okay, so you'll need to back the boat up. The problem with using uh, this type of rig and using a floater is that quite often the floater, you're backing up on it, where the guy that's using this one's going, hey, 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 slow down, my line's right in front of the boat. It's hard to do them both together, um, so you sort of got to work that out between you. Stewie's always complaining. But um, my jig's out there, <laughs> the line's out there. <laughs> All about you, Stewie. But anyhow. <laughs> uh, it is very hard if everyone's fishing yeah. differently, but yeah. like you try to make do on the day. Yeah, you yeah. do. You try to do on the day. What size uh, is that leader? Uh, that, that one there is actually a pre rig, which is this one you got there. I think it's some 50 or 60 pound yeah. fluorocarbon. Yeah. 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 They're a good rig, they work well. Eh? You swivel on the top. And with that, would you just like carbon belly on? Yeah, so this is a good question. Good. Perfect. Um, I, I love to use um, the pilly, I cut the pilly in half and I put the hook through the eye of the pilly and then I just put a piece of squid on to hold the pilly intact. The fish bite it, they mulch the pilly up, the head's a bit hard to pull off um, and then they just go, because they feel, taste good, whatever, they just eat the whole thing. And the squid's hard to get off. If I just put a pilly on there, they mulch it and they generally take the whole thing. They don't come back for a second bite, there's nothing there. But if I put the squid, through the eye of the pilly, it's just swinging on there, and this bit of squid on, which I'm going to show you how to do now, uh, it works really good, mate. Yeah. Good. Did you say you prefer circles on the pattern? Yeah, 100%. So, good question, too, Peter. So, um, these are um, oh, not, uh, they're circles, but they're, um, what's the name? <laughs> I feel the type. Is it a mutsu? A mutsu, mutsu, yeah. mutsu, hard name to remember. Um, Japanese name, um, but they're called mutsu. So mutsu are like kicked back like that, 
where our circle hook's on like that with the top rolled over. These are actually kicked back on an angle, um, which are really good because they're, they're very wide in the bottom, so it allows you to get a lot of bait on, on a little hook. So the, the head and the squid works perfect on there, mate. Um, I find squid and pillies by far just the stable diet for fish out here. They seem to love it. Um, I might use um, like flash like uh, slimies or, or yakkers if I've got some left over that died in the tank, whatever. I'll fill up them up and use them as well. And they work really well as well, but still nothing works as good as pilchers and squid. Go out. Why you use hooks? Because, sorry, that's, that's on the bottom fairly tight. Yep. This is quite loose. And the obje objective is, of it is to keep that as loose as you can. And when the fish bites on it, it rolls, it hooks them up. Okay. I don't know if you've ever, has anyone ever been hooked up by a circle hook? I know I have. Has anyone been, I'm hooked up actually now. I can't. <laughs> you can't pull on it because it'll get you. So um, you just cannot get off it. So as soon as you put any weight on it, it hooks itself. Where if you, and you don't need to strike. So they're the hooks that you use and we use all the time for deep dropping in. We don't, the rod's in the rod hole, we don't even touch the rod. It's electric reel. They just hook themselves. And it's the same deal with this type of rig here. Um, you don't really strike on it. Like it's, and you, it's really hard not to strike on it because you want to go all the time you get a good bite. But it's actually the fish already hooked up. That's the, that's the feel you get. It's already on there. They've hooked themselves. Where if you use a, a J hook, um, a normal type suicide hook, you've got to set it. Sometimes they'll, they'll grab it and pull it and hook themselves. Um, so you've got the option. So in your bag, you've got that type of hook uh, called a Mutsu hook. Uh, the Matsu Mutsu. Uh, Something like that. Yeah, <laughs> I can't remember the name of it. <laughs> we use it for our rock jet, deep drop rigs in here. Um, and, uh, and you've got normal type for float lining. You've got both. Take your pick. But try, I'd try both. Try them both, Pete. Yeah. And, and both test. And, both. Yeah, and you'll find that they'll work better and you'll find the dress hooks work heaps better. Yeah, so. Um, putting squid on and pillies on, on a hook. I might do this now. I'll cut this off and pass it around. So a squid like that size there, I'll cut it in half. So I'll cut it closer to the head side here, so around, around about that, that area there. And I've got that piece plus the head. And then the other one, I'll, I've got the whole thing to go through twice on the, on the back part. The California squid you get, you cut it in three pieces. So you get the cone, the, the top part, the middle part, and then again about a 10 or 15 mil piece before the head, and that's enough. One, one hooks through the bottom part, and then one through the head, okay? Because if you leave the head hanging without a hook in it, they always rip it straight off. So I'll just quickly um, find a knife here. So my scissors are good. So what do you do with the tail section of the pilly? Cut it off to burly, do whatever you want to do with it. Um, it's up to you guys. You've got plenty of scissors, don't they? Sorry? You've got plenty of scissors. <laughs> Didn't that before, we couldn't find any. <laughs> Stewie found a whole stash. So the, the pilter's just through the eye, that's it guys, okay? So you only use the head Yeah, I just like to use the head. I bet, you know, give you mate the other part. Probably not, probably not the ones here tonight. <laughs> here mate, is it? Uh, I, and I do do Yeah, that. I just get a bunch of tails. <laughs> <when we go. laughs> the, other day, <laughs> the other day, I cut it all up and I said, uh, Jack and Stuart, I said, here's your bait. And they're all tail sections. <laughs> <laughs> now they know why. <laughs> but I'll just pass that around. So, oh, sorry. Yeah. Thank you. There's a bit of gooey stuff coming out of the squid. Sorry about that. But, uh, you know, you'll see that. Thanks, mate. Any questions on that at all, folks? Okay, so I said, like, my son Jack, um, he, he only likes to jig. He doesn't use bait fishing at all. Um, but for snapper, he won't use flow line, but he'll, he will use a jig as long as, it, I mean, a, a rig as long as it's dressed like those hooks. And quite often we'll go out and he'll get the biggest snapper for the, on the day on fishing a pattern oster with that type of thing, with bait on obviously. Um, but he might get a five or six kilo snapper on it, you know, 
and uh, I'm float lining, catching 35 centimetre ones. And what does he do, chicken? No, he just, no, he loves chicken. He, he does not use them bait, but because they're like a bit like a lure, he, he'll use that. Oh, sort the of thing. Uh, same as that one there, mate. Yeah, that style of thing. Yeah. Um, <coughs> but he gets bigger fish on it than I do sometimes, and I'm fishing the right way to catch the biggest snapper, but I just don't get the biggest snapper. So. Can you put too much? You can. So don't put too much bait on a hook. Good question. So y your hook should always be uh, semi exposed. So even a circle hook, you don't want too chunky in that gap. So it's full of bait in there, right? And they get a bite on it. That it it's got to pivot around to hook them. And if it can't pivot around because there's too much chunk in there, it won't work. So you don't want too much bait on a hook. Some people say you can't put enough bait on a hook. I disagree with that. Yeah. Skimpier the better. I used to fish with a gentleman years ago. I uh, was from a bottom fish in the fifties, but catching snapper, pearlies, whatever. Um, he was a heart surgeon, very wealthy guy, very tight, <laughs> and he would get three baits out of that little bit of squid there. He cut that in like that, and that would be, and he cut that off there like that, and that would be his three pieces of bait like that, and he put one on each hook of his pat noster and smash it. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> and he'd always catch lots of fish. Quintus was his name, nice guy. Um, and it definitely works. I, I think if there's if they're hungry, and as long as it's bait on that hook, they'll bite it. We don't matter, Tony. We send up, drop down for bait, trying to get a squid about that big, come up with a freaking three cod like that. Literally, that's all right, yeah. Bat. Yes. Bat there, yeah, elephants eat peanuts, we say. Same as all, all types of fish. But um, definitely, um, Sometimes I think too much bait's not the best thing. Okay, um, so we've done that. Uh, when you will go now, so any more questions on the float lining side? So we'll quickly go to the Pat Noster style fishing. Is there any more questions on that at all? You guys are all cool on that? Okay. Um, Pat Noster fishing, as Stuart was saying before, if you're going to do Pat Noster fishing, bottom fishing, it's best that everyone just does the bottom fishing. Okay, you know exactly when to back up together, everyone's in sync and it works much better. You all get bites at the same time because you're backing up, the line's gone loose, and then some bang, 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 you're on. Um, it's really important though that you use probably a similar size sinker. Okay, because one guy might have a, a lighter sinker on and his line's going to be at the back further, and then you'll have a heavier sinker on and you've backed up on your line, you don't need to get back any further, but he's still saying, hey, hang on, keep going back, keep going back, because my line's still way out there and I need to make it loose, you know? So try and keep the sinker size all the same, if you, on the same boat, if you can. Got a really big boat, probably doesn't matter if you're just drifting, but if you've got a smaller boat, you're backing up a lot, you need to keep the sinker size the same. Um, leader, if I'm fishing a Pat Noster, and I'm fishing, say, um, 24 fathoms, like 40 to 50 pounds enough, okay? If you're fishing 36 fathoms, I'd say 60 pounds, and, and not fluorocarbon. If you're fishing um, out on the 50s, you enhance the chances of getting bigger fish, like amberjacks and kings and, and other big bycatch. Did you say not fluorocarbon? Not over 60, it gets a bit too twisty. Okay. Yeah, it twists up when you make a pattern stuff. Under is not too bad, but over is bad, yeah. Twist, twisty. 60 is about the limit. Um, but uh, yes, yeah, so I use about 80 or 100 out there because um, you might get a 20 kilo amberjack or 30 kilo amberjack jump on your line. If you're using 50 pound leader, you won't get to see it. Okay? You need to fish heavy. And as I was saying earlier, the fish out there aren't as timid as they are in close, they're, they're aggressive. Not over 60 pound. Oh, right. And not make a patent Oster rig out of anything more than 60 sure. pound. It just gets too twisty, mate. Yeah. Right. Okay. yeah. So, yeah. so the, um, the, you pre rigs with pearlies? Yes. So they're just as good for snapper? Yeah, they are really good for snapper. So, if, yeah, we do a pre rig for pearly, which is these fellows here, like that style there. Um, they work really well on snapper as well. That's what um, yeah, and you'll catch even 35 centimetre yeah. snappers on there. Uh, the hooks are small enough, but they're strong enough to catch, obviously, a 30 kilo bass bar cod or something. Yep. Um, but if you're going to um, do your Pat Noster rig, 
My suggestion would be to keep your hooks around about, uh, if you make your own up, around about 60 centimetres apart. So your whole rig's actually like two metres long. So three hooks. I always put a gang hook on the top. And recently I've been using that one that's going around that dressed gang hook. They're really good on the top. Um, then two circle hooks, um, 6-0s, 7-0s, whatever, um, on the next two hooks. And my rig is pilchard, pilchard squid, pilchard squid, exactly what we see there. Or just squid on the bottom two hooks. Do you have a length of your dropper? Yeah, I do. So I try and make the dropper reasonably long, actually. I like to have my line a bit off the bottom, especially if we got wire weed and stuff like that. So I read about probably 50 to 60 centimetres. Yep. Yeah, so not too long, but um, we just use dropper loops, unless you want to make it up with swivels and do like the nice rig like that type of thing that's all crimped up, whatever. Um, but um, around about oh, 20 centimetres is enough. Yep, 20 centimetres. And um, so dropper loop, dropper loop, dropper loop. Uh, swivel about probably that far above your top hook, not too far above it. And um, bead or tube or... You can buy those skirt things on their own as well and put them on there. Um, nothing worse than making up a really nice rig. You've done it at home and drop down and you hook it at the bottom straight away. I hate that. <laughs> so, look, next with the bare hooks come back out, there's a hook goes on this. Can you use those three-way swivels? Yeah, you can use three-way swivels. So there's many different types. Um, the ones, like we sell them all down there, but the ones that are just like swivel, swivel with a little one attached to the center swivel, don't get those. It's like a little pin that goes through. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They, they break, they twist up so bad, and they're a lot of hassle to do, to make. You're better off getting the proper one, still, still put the hassle of making it, but um, they spin around each other. So if you get a fish up and swim around circles and the line, the middle line doesn't get twisted up. Yeah. Okay, all the crimp on one, same deal, they spin around the middle. Yeah. So, um, but those rigs that you got there, which is the one that I showed you before, the two hook rig, um, they come in a box like that, and there's two sets in there. They come from 2.0s to 7.0s. They're really well dressed, and they're quite well priced. Like they're, oh, this is only a little fellow. That's a um, 2.0, that's only about 10, 10, 11 bucks. But 5.0s are about, um, for two, this is a full Lumo job too, this particular one here, but, or the UV, um, that's a 4.0, sorry. 7-0. Anyhow, whatever size you got, 7-0 <laughs> is a good size too. 7-0 um, would be a great size out of the 50s, but they're on 80 pound, oh, they're actually on 80 pound fluorocarbon. But they don't twist up. Anyhow, uh, but they do a different knot. They don't do a looper knot. They use, a, they use like, um, how do they do that knot? They sort of cut it yeah, in there. I don't know. They, like, they like join the line into the line so it can actually spin, right? Um, but they work well and they're, uh, I think for t for four hooks they're eighteen ninety eight less, so about thirteen bucks for rig dressed, which is pretty good. You can't buy a fly for that price, <laughs> and these are like flies. And um, and I join the two together, so I'd cut with the little loopies on the bottom, so that far below your hook, cut it and then tie it to the swivel, and then make it that long with four hooks. When you're fishing out eighty to hundred meters, it's just too deep to have two hooks on, unless you're on a charter boat. Because less tangles. Yeah. They should be fishing four hooks or three hooks. <laughs> um, so, yes, yeah, it's not a bad, not bad value. We can see like a proper rig like that made up's about uh, 20, 24 bucks or something like that. So it's half the price of that. <coughs> Probably not as good, but not too bad. Um, so, getting back to what size sinker do we use when you're fishing out the 50 fathoms? The current out there, generally speaking, is a lot faster than in closed skies. So, um, particularly when it's in around sort of November to March, it's around about up to three knots and we need to use sometimes a kilo when fishing like a knot in 100 metres. So um, generally speaking, um, a 12 or a 16 ounce is enough, which is those. Eight would be okay if you're using P3 line, very light line, but generally speaking, you've got to use a 12 or a 16 ounce, which is three quarter or one pound. But, uh, 80 to 120 sort of thing. Uh, we catch snapper out to 280 metres, just to let you know that too. That's the deepest we caught them. Um, and there's heaps on that 200, 220 metre mark. Heaps and heaps. And is it only a tiered option that you use? Yep. Like, is there something else? Or? Uh, no, these are all that sort of bomb t-shirt shape, yeah. 
No, I try and keep it sort of long rather than round. Yeah, it gets down quicker, less drag, and less hook up on the bottom. <laughs> so um, we have a lot of wild weed guys off the Gold Coast here. So wild weed grows on the back of the 36s and the back of the 50 fathom roost. And the snapper and the pearl is love wild weed. So as, does, anyone, does anyone not know what wild weed is? Okay, it looks like we had an exhibit A, but it got snapped in half. So, yeah, it was because this is a, this is the third time it's broken down. <laughs> so it looks like a car spring. Okay, that's it there, and, and it's springy like a car spring, but it's actually coral, and uh, it's the snapper and the pearlies love living in this stuff, and this is actually joined to here which is joined to another piece up here. Um, and that's about the average length, it's about probably half a metre long. But I have seen pieces that are a metre and a half long, like five or six foot long. Um, and if you've ever experienced, especially on the back, even if you only fish out in 36 fathoms, on the back side of 36 fathoms, in that 68 metre mark sort of thing, um, where you've got caught on the bottom, but then it sort of pulls it through, if you know what I mean. So you think you're snagged up, and all of a sudden it just releases. It's not because it's got caught on a rock and popped off, because it's dragging through this stuff. So your line sort of goes through it and, and then it pulls out and stuff bends over and it pops out, whatever. And, it, and quite often just even just backing up or just driving forward a bit will pull it, the lines out of it. You think it's snagged up, but it comes out. But the fish are in amongst there. And um, many, many, many times um, we've been, we found the wire weed in the bottom, it's quite fuzzy. Uh, it comes up like a greeny, uh, bluey colour on the, on the bottom of your red on the top of it, and it's very hug in the bottom. And sometimes you can see the fish above it, other times you'll see nothing but the wire weed. And then when the bite time happens and the fish come on the bite, all of a sudden there's all these dots above the bottom. They come out of the wire weed. They live in the wire weed. So you need to find that, find the wire weed. So any questions on that at all? Okay. Um, okay, just to quickly show you something on the sounder here again. So how many people here um, can't get to the 36 fathom reef? Where is it? Uh, it's about 20 k's out. Oh, definitely not. Definitely not? How big's your boat, mate? Um, 16 foot. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. On a good day. Not time to go yeah, out there, yeah. but yeah, but you can do it. <laughs> Mine's only 16 foot. It's only, it's only, carby, it's only V6 carby, though. Okay, that's... So that's probably restricted on how many you all got, how much you've got. Right, okay, yeah, okay. That's, that's fair. That's fair enough. Yeah, that's fair enough. Um, so if you get the opportunity, the closest is about 18 k's out straight at the front. And, and if we go to the mark side, I'll show you which one it is. Okay. How far from the Fat 11 is that? Um, Fat 11 is um, the most further north one. Yeah, yeah that's uh, about 20 k's, that's right, correct. Most of it's about 20 k's, mate. Yeah, 11 nautical miles sort of thing. And um, if you go right up off jumping pin, north of jumping pin, it's still the same depth, obviously. You're 30 k's up sort of thing, and same at Tweed, you're 30 k's down. Um, but straight at the front here, you're 18 k's, about not, not 9 or 10 miles here. Yeah. yeah, Fed 12, a, 12 B and C, they're on, they're about, uh, about 22 k's, around about 11 miles as well. Yeah. Mm. Um, but what you guys need to look for and need to understand, because uh, we've sort of done the float lining in close, so now we're out in the 36s and we've got a float line still. It's going to be a bit bigger sinkers. We're going to use like a six ball sinker or five ball sinker, something like that, on our lighter line and on our heavier line, which I showed before. The 30 or 50 pound braid, I might use like about a seven ball to get it down or a six ball. Um, and we're still going to catch snapper float lining. It's just going to cast a bit further and wait a bit longer for it to get to the bottom. But you'll get a lot of good big snapper. What depth are you looking for? About 65 to... There's, uh, I'll show you, there's two, there's two um, runs on the 50 Fathom Reef, uh, 36 Fathom Reef, so just before I go any further, how many guys here don't fish the Gold Coast? Okay, a couple of you don't. So it's been the same scenario up your way, mate, if you're off Brisbane, are you? Oh, I've only ever fished Turkey Beach, 770. Oh, okay. Never fished Gold Coast or... Okay, you're, you're, living on the, you're living on the Gold Coast now, or Brisbane? Yeah, yeah, I've got a boat uh, Okay, perfect then. Okay, so you're into it. Yeah, so um, you'll probably get through the seaway to get used to the pin bar, I guess. So 
in that scenario, this is what we'll be talking about. <laughs> so, perfect. So, um, we have two, two rows of reef here. So, if we're north facing up, I'm going to ask a question. How many people here run their GPS in circles where you're chasing the dog all the time? And just keeps turning around when you're turning around. And how many people here run it north facing up? North facing up. Yeah, good. Stick with north facing up if you don't mind, please. It works better. <laughs> so north facing up, you either go north or you go south. <laughs> the other one you go around circles. I just can't get used to video. Some people do. Um, so north, south, and this is east over here, west over here. Is that right? That's right. So, so, <laughs> so um, we have two rows of reef here on the 36s, um, which north of the seaway. So we have a, they're exactly one nautical mile apart from each other. There's two, two uh, like ridges. And they're both around about six to seven k's long and they're, they're covered with sand along that um, length at certain areas. Okay. Um, so you just need to work out where the fish are. Sometimes they're on the inside edge and sometimes they're on the outside edge. So um, it, unless you know the fish are on the outside edge, you always stop at the inside first. But you've got to remember, um, if you're going out in the, in the dark and you arrive, you want to get that first crack of sunlight, and that's when the biggest snapper bite. Um, you need to know, um, you need to like know straight away that I know the spot works and I'm going to give it just one drift, five minutes, if I don't get a fish, you've got to go to the next row. Don't, don't try another area in that area because they're not there. If they're not somewhere on that inside ridge, ridge, they're on the outside edge. Okay? Does that make sense? Because they, they just seem to go from one to the other, but not just in one area all the way along. Okay? So it's like that and like that with little gaps in between it sort of thing, if that makes sense. But the ridges are like that, and they're quite long. So you get a good drift along it. And uh, um, in some areas, maybe six metres. They'll come from, so this one here comes from about uh, 60, sorry. I think that comes from about 64 or 65, or oh, 64 I think it is, up in most areas, up to about 60 on the top and then it drops down to about 66 or 67 and it can come up to about 60 on the top of that one too and then it sort of drops down so the bottom inclines like that and then when it gets to here it sort of goes like that a bit more it's quite an aggressive little drop off on that edge and that's called the back edge of the 36s when we say the back edge of 36s that's what we're talking about so the bottom's like that, and then the back edge it sort of goes a little bit steeper. When you get to, it's like 80 metres, then levels out forever to get to the 50 fathom reef. And people say, I'm at the 50 fathom reef, I'm in 80 metres, but you're not, you're at the start of the 80 metres, but it stays 80 metres for 15 k's because <laughs> it drops off to 80 pretty quick just out here. And then, it, then when you get to the 50 fathom reef, um, that's which is around 88 metres, 86 metres on this side, and it'll come up to maybe 80 on the top. And then it drops off, that, that was like there, this one's more like this, it's a lot more aggressive, again. And then it just keeps going down with little ridges on, on, on down. Does that make sense? Okay. So, but we're going to fish for snapper either here or here. So we've got our marks and um, on here, and it just depends on where you want to go as to, to finding the snapper. So as I said, try this spot here first, wherever it is on here, which... Should we just quickly do it now? If you grab your GPS sheet, sorry guys, this is a little bit boring, but you need to know this. <laughs> so where it says under 70 metres, um, the reason why I say under 70 metres is because most of your 36,000 reefs are under 70 metres and then it drops down quite deep and to get to 50,000 reef. Um, but if you look at the, the first number, the like 27 number, that's the latitude on your, on your um, GPS. And the other one's your longitude, the 153 is your longitude. So where it says 
That's the inside edge. That's this one. And where it says 153.37, that's the outside edge. Does that all make sense? So if you're going to go to the inside edge first, it's the one that says 153.36. And then when you look at the 27 number, the 27.40 or 38, or it might be, represents um, how far north you are. So to give you some idea, the jumping pin bar is on about 27.43, I think. Um, so 27.40 and 27.38, those first two, north of jumping pin bar. That's what we call the A mark in the old GPS days, before GPS. Um, and then 27.46 is a couple of miles south of the, of the jumping pin bar. So every time that number changes from, like, from 27.46 to 27.48, we've gone two miles south, two nautical miles south. And to get a kilometre, it's about it times about 1.8, so it's about 3.6 k south. Um, and then you can see on 2748, 344, there's the, a number there, 153.36, which is probably around here somewhere. Um, and then on the exact same latitude, there's another spot direct opposite it, out on the outside ledge there, 2748, 153.37. So there's a spot there and a spot there. So put all those marks in and you'll see, you'll see two different lines on your GPS if you put all those marks in. That's what I'm trying to say. Then it's up to you which ones you want to go to. Okay. Um, and for the guys down Tweed Way, um, 2809 20, is about off Tweed Head, so that's way down south. You don't have two lines down there. It stops at about, um, it stops at about uh, probably east, or just north, of, say Bayview Harbour. So it stops those two ridges. So they go down from nearly Jumping Pin Bar all the way down to nearly Bayview, and then it just goes to one line then, all the way down Tweed. Okay. Yes, mate. All those GPS marks you gave us in the, the Jew one mm. you did last time were like, probably like, yeah, southeast. Yes. Is that yes. like the 24s? Yes, correct. Okay. Yes, it is, mate, yeah. Yeah, so 24 fathoms is, um, which is on the first row, the first slot here, it says under 50 metres. So for those of you with smaller boats, and this is where you get a lot of big snapper, um, my favourite snapper grounds are anywhere from that 27.56, 153.28 and all the way down to, that's all the way down, but down to 27.59, that, that whole area there, which is about uh, six k's from the seaway down to say um, Q1 um, and out in that sort of um, 35 to 42 metre mark. Um, that's really good stamper country. Good mackerel country too, it's in, in the Spanish around. But you've got to put all these marks in and go give them a shot, okay? And fish the way we're telling you, early morning. The trouble is the whales, guys. You've got to watch out for whales. Oh, my gosh. The other day as we were talking, one jumped up in front of me. I think it was on Monday morning I was going out. Just had a quick snapper fish and um, I was only 20 metres deep and it just popped up out of the water right in front of me. So you've got to be really careful. So, you know, if you're getting out in the dark, a bit of moonlight helps, which is at the moment, it's not too bad. But if you go out in those dark, dark nights where there's no moon, um, you've really got to have a visual eye out and just sit on maybe 15 knots or whatever. Something you can pull up pretty quick on. If you're doing 25 knots and it's pitch black, you've you got, you got big nuts. <laughs> As I'm trying to say. <laughs> yeah, which was us the other night. Till we come back. Because <laughs> we know the whales have been there. We've seen whales all day. And our mate Tibby, he's a nice guy, Tibby, if you're watching. But um, we're coming back in, and uh, we finished deep dropping at about five o'clock. It was dark, dark. And the fish are biting their heads off, but we had to go. We just said we've got to stop. That's enough. And, um, and it was a 70k run back to the seaway. And Timmy's got a big carbo, very nice boat. And he just says, hang on, boys. And we're doing, I don't know, 25, yeah. 28 knots or something. And, it's pitch black. I can't even see the front of the boat. <laughs> it's just pitch black. Just going, we're just going. We're, just, we're hanging on secretly on the side of the boat like this, getting ready for the brace. To brace yourself but in case we hit something. And um, anyhow, we didn't hit something, thank gosh. But we'll keep an eye out. Yeah. Does, it, does that boat live at Bayview? No, it's up at the surface area. Yeah. Really nice uh, uh, yeah, they're nice boats. <laughs> Yeah, so that's a really good question too. 
Um, Spolock is a really good thing if you're the first person there. Um, it's one of those things where you can't really, someone's on the spot, they're doing a drift, they drift off it and you're going to lock yourself on it. That's a, not a good thing. <laughs> um, but fishing wise, mate, um, if you've got on your own and there's not too much current, I'd 100% say, as I was saying earlier, if you know the fish are there, definitely use spot lock or put your anchor up, one of the two. And cut up pillies, cut up pillies, burly up. Um, now, years ago, we used to even burly up with wheat. We were fishing in sub 50 metres. We used to I use dress wheat, it's called dress wheat. It's like a, uh, like a barley type stuff. And put tuna all with it. And every sample we caught clean, this is full of, full of it. And we got them up off the bottom. We got them up to like, they hit hitting their bait at half the distance down to the bottom. Yeah. So if, um, so how many guys have you got that, um, electric motors on their boats? Quite a few of you have. So yeah, take advantage of your cans. There's not too much current. They, they, they're not good in the current because your line just goes out the back of the boat's too fast. You're better off drifting. So, but in wind, they're so good. Would you use a parachute? Uh, yeah. So I've, I've got, we sell them downstairs. Yeah. I meant to grab one actually, but yeah. to show you guys. But how, <laughs> how many guys here use a parachute? Yeah, a few of you do. They're really good. Um, if you don't have one, I'd probably suggest, I know they're a bit big, big and bulky to keep, but keep it in the boat. Um, and they're just such a, um, a great thing that, you're like, I don't know how many parachutes I've ran over my boats over the years, but lots. If you get about them, you're quick, eager to go back. I feel like drift, you just smash. They've got three big snappers or whatever. And like, and parachute. Hands around a prop or the race with a prop. And, oh, jeez. Get the gaff and get the knife. We actually we take tape out like duct tape. And we tape it uh, quite often we've had to do this. So we'll tape a, um, a, a knife, bait knife, to the end of the gaff handle. And because you can't reach over and there's no way to jump the water into it. Little sharks we see. Uh, <laughs> silly sharks. Um, you're on the boat, don't you? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> so, so keep duct tape and a sharp knife and a long handle gaff in your boat all the time. Okay. <laughs> but um, but anyhow, um, yeah, parachute's a great thing. Or you learn to reverse up. My suggestion is definitely learn to reverse up first. You can't reverse up very much when you get a parachute on. It doesn't work. The parachute stops working and you, all of a sudden you start sailing again. And you can't reverse up anymore because you'll probably get caught in the boat. So you've either got to use a parachute or you reverse, as simple as that. Or you use spotlight. Okay. What percentage of your fishing do you do float lining versus down the spot? Um, if I'm fishing, uh, definitely first up in the morning, I only float line. I don't bottom bash. Jack bottom bashes though, my son. Uh, yeah, yeah, at the front. He sits at the front, does it? Um, but no, I'll, I'll only float line. And at the thirty-six fathoms uh, reef, I go straight to there, not the twenty-fours. I definitely float line, straight up. I'm um, using about a five ball or six ball, trying to work out the current and the wind. Um, the fifty fathom reef uh, come next month. Um, at the moment, the snapper already turned up there apparently. So we start at wide first, guys, because the water's cold out there, right? As the water gets down deep, it's very cold. So the snapper are at the 50 fathom reefs now. So if you get the 50s, you'll catch them. Um, you'll catch consistent, bigger ones if you do float line out there, but it takes a long time to get down. It's quite slow fishing. You're using about a six or eight ball. It just takes a long way to get down 80 or 100 metres, okay? Um, but you get really good fish. And they'll smash on the way down there. You get absolutely smashed. The 50s northeast is my favourite ground to do it. Um, as the time progresses, I will go out the front here east and around about sort of August, but I'll start on the 50s and all this. Um, but at the, once in the next sort of two weeks, they'll start moving in, in numbers to the 36s. Um, and that's definitely the go because it's sort of just deep enough to get quality uh, fish in numbers, does that make sense? So catch a lot of 60s or 70s maybe, you know, or the odd 80 or whatever it might be. Um, if you're fishing on the 24s, you've got to wait for those big ones to turn up. When they turn up, they're in big numbers. But um, getting them up on light gear is, is the problem. So we fish light because we don't get as many consistent big ones in close. But when you get a big one on, you're going to get busted up. So you've got to have a heavy rod in the boat of some type. So um, I didn't talk about overheads except for that little one bottom fishing. but. The top of the float line for snapper, you can't cast an overhead, right? Not very well. If you've got bait casters, you can. Um, but 
Uh, if you're using spotlight or you're drifting, uh, anchor, sorry, um, you can use overheads, like small overheads, TLDs, whatever, 15s, small reels, um, or bigger bait caster like a beast or whatever type bait, bait caster you got will work. And slow pitch type jig rods are really good for float lining as well. So if you've got slow pitch jig rods, fantastic for float lining. Soft tip, they take the tip down, you catch a big snapper. Um, so if you've got that availability to go wide at the moment, go wide, that's what I'm trying to get it. And in two weeks time, hit the 36s and by the end, 1st of July, end of the month, hit the 24s uh, in, in more consistency of big fish. At the moment, they're hit and miss. But they'll be... You're only two <laughs> yeah, you're only allowed two, yeah. So um, total of um, four fish per person. One, one, one over 60 or 70 or whatever. Yeah, one right. over 70. Is that two per boat or one per boat? Because two people on the boat. Yeah. yeah. Uh, one each. I think it's one each. Yeah. One each. Yeah. It's a bit of a yeah. It's a bit of a tricky one. Um, and they, they've got also the obviously the closures coming in soon as well, um, which is in the first of July to the thirteenth of August or fifteenth of August. I think it is. Oh, mid July. Mid July. Sorry, mid July to mid August. Sorry, fifteenth to fifteenth. That's right. Yeah. So. Um, but this year, we're going to have an early season, so we've got plenty of time to have some fun. Yeah. Okay. Um, any other questions at all, guys, on that? On the, de on the bottom side, the Pat Noster style? Quickly, going to really quickly, we've got like five minutes. I'm going to tell you about uh, Cobia. How many guys here have caught a big Cobia? No? Okay. Um, good. And how big, like 20 kilo? Yeah, good. Yeah, good, yeah, good. Um, they go crazy, right? They go hard. And um, they're really hard to gaff, very hard to gaff. They roll and rip the gaff out of your hand. So <laughs> you need to have your gaffing techniques up to date. Make sure your mate's a mate that you can sort of go mad at and he doesn't get run away from you. Because he'll probably maybe lose it. <laughs> <So> <laughs> Make sure he gaffs at least that size, okay? At least. That's a good size for snapper. But when you get a Kobe with a big box head about this big on it, it's not really appropriate. You have to you have to actually probably hook it in the mouth and do it uh, yeah, under. Yeah, it is. They're really hard. That head's like a rock. Yeah. It's really hard. Don't try and get it in the head. You'll, if you go in the middle part, the tail's so powerful they'll they'll bend and they'll rip it out of your hand. So my suggestion is probably in the head area from under, underneath the head. Um, but if you've got a bigger gaff, you can go in the middle, but you have to try and get it in the boat at the same time as you're gaffing it. Do they have, do they have teeth? Uh, they, they have raspy yeah, little like teeth. Raspy, yeah. raspy little teeth. The... Oh, you probably do, but they're very powerful. But they're hard to yeah. keep still to do that. They're not like a Dewey where Dewey just pops up and says belly up. These things would still want to take off across the top. Um, they look like sharks, so don't try and cut your line when you first see. If you haven't seen one before and you think you've got a shark on, half the time it's a COVID this time of year. So they really look like sharks. Like the other day, we were spanning crabbing in a couple of cups. They were eating the legs, like I was telling you. And um, I thought they were sharks. Even I thought they were sharks for a moment until they come up higher. Um, so um, have that gaff ready, have it sharp. And uh, they will thrash around the boat pretty hard. So you need to dong them on their head. And you need to make sure you have a good donger because they're really hard on the head to dong. Okay? They break dongs. Um, but the, the hardest part of fighting a cobia is that. It, it tends to want to um, either first brick on the bottom. If it doesn't do that, it'll then try and, uh, it'll go across the top of the water, it'll come up to the, to the top, that's when they got a cobia on. So most other big fish, snapper, amberjacks, kings, stay down deep. These guys will come to the top a bit, like a marlin does, um, and they'll scoot out along the top and they'll swim around along the joint and they're very powerful runs because their tail's so thick and big. And um, you'll just have to, if you don't wear out first, you've got to wear them out. This is matter, that's all it is, simple as that. It's back and forward, back and forward, back and forward to get flying to the boat. Um, the only predator they really have if you're fighting it might be sharks. There's a lot of sharks there at the moment, so they're on the surface everywhere and their whales are in that sort of two metre mark, so they'll eat the cobia if you've got it on a line. Um, but other than that, you, you should not lose it once you get out towards the top. They may. They're quite long, right? If you get a big one that's like around 30 kilos or 40 kilos, they're probably around about 1.6 to 1.8 metres long. And they may 
uh, the tail may break your lead if it's not long enough. So um, if you're fishing live baits, my suggestion is to run a lead at the stews two, two or three metres long. Overhead at least three metres long, spin maybe two metres long. Okay. Um, and I'd be running about 80 to 100 pounds, nothing under that. And I'd be using 80 hooks, which I think you guys have got some in your bag as well. Um, just a couple of 80 like this. And some leader, this is 80 pounds, but around 80 to 100 pounds. We'll quickly just do this up and, and uh, put it in that slimy there. I'll pass it around. So good to eat, so good to eat. Yeah, so has anyone eaten cobra here? How nice it is? It's so nice, yeah. Definitely great, yeah. Do they, hit, um, jigs and like they will. I've caught them on jigs and I've caught them trolling too, believe it or not. Yeah. But, um, what are they like compared to, like, say, kingfish? And uh, uh, better. Better? Like yeah. More, more okay, the kingfish is like very powerful um, down deep. These are like the, the surface version of them, if that makes sense. Very powerful runs. They'll fight you all the way to the boat. Yeah, not... I'll fight you to yep. the boat. And then at the boat. <laughs> in, the, in the boat too, that's right. <laughs> it's true. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Only because I've lost my glasses. I've been looking for them all night. I did that. If you want to stop them going, I mean, you just stab them in the head. I mean, you were saying it's very No, you'll break your knife. I've done that too. <laughs> oh, if you got that uh, sp icky spike, yeah, hundred percent. Uh, oh, you have to put it at the right spot, but yeah, you could do that. I just put, if you got the luxury of a big of a big bag, like a like a a bigger version of that, you know, like one point five meter one. Um, I would definitely straighten the bag if you can get it in the bag with the gaff, zip him up and let him thrash away. Yeah, they'll die pretty quick, but. Is that right? Take him on oh, Stewie's good. He's good, mate. He's a hand model. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Stuart. How quick was that? Do you need to bleed on it all, Doug? Uh, like yeah. Kobe, yeah, I'd definitely suggest bleeding it, yeah. So when it starts yep. to calm down a bit, then you can then... Um, yeah, them yeah. They're, they're, not, like, they're not as bad as dolphin fish. Dolphin fish are the most crazy of all yeah. for thrashing around. But Kobe's probably brought up there second, I'd say. They're up there. Yeah. They're just beasts. They're just like big serpents. Yeah. Okay, so this is the same scenario, guys, for um, chasing jewies at night or whatever, or cobia, it doesn't matter. So, or amberjacks, kingies. But uh, there are a lot of big slimies, a lot bigger than that at, out there at the moment, particularly out on the sort of 50 fathom area. So I do exactly the same scenario as I showed you before where I'm going to put it through here, I'm going to pop it out, and it's going to sit out sideways like so. It's not going to be hook stuck in there. I want the hook well exposed, okay? So I'm just going to measure it out so that my first hook will work in here, okay? So just in here, pop it through as far down as you can, and the top's exposed, just like so, like that, okay? And then this one here, same deal again. I just like to go down through the nose. If I go through the eye, it pops out of the eye. Particularly on, on, in live is you don't stick to the eye because you'll, you'll kill it. I've got my glasses on now and I still can't see it. It's right. going to be a live bait, isn't it? It's going to be a live bait, that's right. Slimy little bugger. Slip around my hands. Can you ever chuck a sneaky little treble in there? You can down the back if I'm fishing for, for Spanish mackerel, I will, but not for these other guys, no. Right. Don't need to. Yeah, line. yeah. That's actually not quite sitting right, but okay. <laughs> it's a bit soft with a with a real fish that'll hang in there. Thanks, thanks, Drew. Um, so have all that that comes around, but guys, if you're going to fish a live bait, same scenario. I'd be fishing um, on that fellow probably a ten ball sinker, which is a quite a big ball sinker. Um, that's a nine, but anyhow, quite big. Okay about a four ounce ball sinker or a six ounce ball sinker or an eight ounce barrel sinker. Because you're fishing in whatever depth it might be, 40 metres or 100 metres, you just want to hold the big fish down the bottom. Tail is really good bait. If you get a big tailor. Yeah, that yes, sinker, is that down? Right on top of his head, mate. Yeah. A lot of guys will run a leader that long and put the sinker above it. 
It gets tangled up too much, man. They, they swim around each other and get caught up. And Sigler overrides the bait sometimes and they get caught up. So keep it all intact. Um, but Taylor, make sure they're 35 centimetres, you know the rules. Um, on the rig of the knife head, do you put the, you know, you put it to the front there, you get two boats, there's not any... No, oh, sorry. Okay, good question. I didn't take that into account. Okay, so uh, Ross has just said, do you put the hook through, pin it through both like I have there? On the dead bait, because that's the dead bait, I'm used to just doing it, but that's the way I do it. But on the live bait, uh, that way and out the top one. It's the hardest. Yeah, so his bottom mouth can still keep breathing here. Yeah. Okay. Um, so with the cobia, like, um, I would probably... So I'm going to snap a fish and ride on daylight, right? And I've worked out, okay, I've got a couple of snapper or they're not biting today, whatever it might be. And um, there's whales all around me. I'm going to try for cobia. The cobia there, you can't go up to... I'm not, not saying you can't. But by law, you can't. <laughs> But um, a lot of guys have caught um, COVID just pitching a bait in next to a whale swimming past sort of thing. So if you had to be <laughs> facing that way and you're fishing away and didn't hear the whales coming next to one pole next to the boat, I'd throw a live bait straight out, okay? Because there's going to be COVID yeah, sitting right of his date. Oh, they love it, mate. That's, really? They just follow with them. They're feeding off them. I don't know what they're doing, but they're next to them all the time. And that's why the COVID rock up now, because they're with the whales. Sorry, mate. Yeah, so yeah, they're like a, yeah, they're like a remora of the whale, if that makes sense. Yeah. Exactly the same, mate. And with getting on street, can you chuck snaps at them or? Oh, you can chuck pillies out on anything. They'll eat anything, mate. Yeah. Well, say you've got a slug lock on them. Oh, a slug. Oh, no, so no, no. Oh, look, I've never done it, but you could try, but I wouldn't. I, don't, I think they'd, they'd bend the hooks. They'd bend the hooks. They're too powerful, mate. Really? Yeah, 100%. Yeah, because you're talking like average fish, is a small one would be 15 kilo. And yeah, I've exactly got one the other day, which we yeah, tried for COVID, we got one yeah, 70 yeah. centimetres, only a little one. But um, but um, generally speaking, the average is about 20 kilos. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, no, good, it's good. It's good. And like, um, I, I've, I hooked a Kobe about four years ago, my dad and the boat were out snapper fishing, and I actually hooked it on a snapper rig, believe it or not. And um, and it took, unfortunately, it was amongst about five or ten boats, right in the middle of them, sort of thing. And about five of those boats I knew. <laughs> so they were all following me as I'm fighting it. Because <laughs> they come to the top and the guys, oh, there it is over there. Oh, there it is over there. And, um, and it was a freaking monster. It was like 40 kilo one. Wow. And um, anyhow, uh, we ended up losing it. Uh, just log in. It, it actually. 40 minutes to an hour, wow. yeah. But it was only on like 30 pound braid, it's a bit hard. But there's some really big ones out there. We get some of our customers get them up to, you know, 50 kilos. Yeah, they're beasts. But that you can get it to the boat, you've got to land it. If you want to take it home and keep it, you need to have a good gaff shot and be quick. Because so many cobia, if you ask any of their customers, that, I don't know about you guys, but so many cobia lost at the gaff. Can you try and scope? <laughs> you could, as in. Well, you said that way. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, like get it to the surface near the boat, hit them there, or. You'd probably knock it off your line and they'd be more upset. <laughs> I get it in the boat first. <laughs> you could do. <laughs> get it in the boat, you could chuck maybe a wet towel over it and then maybe jump on top of it. <laughs> like, um, if you've got a bag or a lazarus where you can get it out of the way, that's probably the best thing. It's the tail of the head. They're actually like, they're like a big worm. They just roll and do it. They do the, so when you gaff and they roll straight away. And that's what pulls the gaff out of your hand. And some, some of my customers have got the gaff back and swam past and grabbed the gaff again and got it. That's true, I promise you. But it's not all the time that happens that way. <laughs> but if you're lucky enough, it may. Uh, but I always keep two gaffs on my boat, always. Just in case. Yeah, well, flying gas is probably not too bad. It'll thrash itself. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I think over the States they harpoon them, actually. They get them up to the boat and harpoon it. <laughs> what he's talking about there was taking a photo, a photo shoot. <laughs> yeah, probably could. Yeah, yeah, yeah right.
Okay, we're um, just going to edit that part. But now we back here. <laughs> That's all good. <laughs> but um, no, guys, you've got, to get, you've got to do the gaff shot right. It's really important on cobia. Okay? Jewies, easy. So if you're going to get jew fish at the moment um, and you get them up, you finally get them off the bottom, you get them outside the boat, they'll generally sit at the top of the water and oh, 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 they'll make noises and you just gaff them. But if you aren't quick, they'll go back down again. They might do you. You've got that one sort of five second or three second time period when they're stuffed and their belly up to gaff them and get them in the boat, okay? But Kobe, you've got that one choice when it's swimming past to gaff them, but you've got to get them in the boat at the same time. A bit like mackerel, big mackerel, same deal. As they're coming towards you, you gaff from under and pull him straight in the boat at the same time. Okay, don't try and fight it, don't try and hold it. Just get it in the boat. Yeah, so don't, don't hold it, whack it, mate. Yeah. Yes, someone who's, who's good gaff shot. Stewie, <laughs> Stewie. <laughs> <laughs> gaffs and nets don't go well with Stewie at the moment. <laughs> nets are all right. Gaffs are bad when they've got a gape that big and your fish is that wide. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was the first time. Then another time you said my hand was bent. Yeah, it was. <laughs> it's a difference. It was. I think that was a Kobe did that too. Yeah. Anyhow, guys, um, get it there and do it. Have a crack. So, any questions at all? Is that one no, no one's asked about outfits to use on the Kobe outfit. I'd be using like um, minimum 30 pound line, preferably 50 to 80. Okay, the chances are the fish is going to be fairly decent and you want to see it. And what kind of setup is in the modern uh, Just um, big spin or overheads, okay. Um, we get guys fishing with like 50, 50 size reels for Cobia. Uh, but generally speaking, they're using like um, a TLD 25 or, a, or a whatever, Talika 16 or whatever, 20, 30. Yep. And um, and then spin reel size eight probably eight thousand and bigger. If you want to see a big fish, yeah. yeah. And, they run and hard. sorry, mate. Do they just run? Uh, run hard at the start. Yeah, I'm trying to do in the bottom first, and not come up to the top. If you got them off the bottom, they'll they come to the top. And um, the other thing too is with cobia, when you're fishing for them, if you're going to fish spot lock, whatever way you want to do it, um, try and fish three lines. Fish one of the balloon at the back. So you see a lot of guys out there at the moment with balloons at the back. They're fishing for cobia on the top one, and they'll run another one, that's what we do, another one with about a five ball or six ball, so one that fit the bait can sort of come up and down to what he wants, just out there in the middle, and then I'll run one with a ten ball, so it's down at the bottom, like I said before, with that big bait, down the bottom, so <coughs> bottom, middle, top, three lines out, and just wait. And um, are these all out on the 36? No, it's even close, mate. Oh, in close. You'll get them 36s yeah, too, but you don't get as big at 36. They're only like sort of up to 12 kilo maybe. I've never caught... Oh, no, sorry. I did get one at the 36 kilo once. Yeah, right. Yeah. So in close, big cobia. Uh, that's right. For the bigger cobia, mate. Yeah, just on the 18s, 12 fathoms even, the bait rig. Yeah, right. 18s, 24s. Wherever the whales are tracking through is more where they are in, in numbers, but they will come in on, on feed on bait. Yeah. And then they sort of go off the whales again. Yeah. What kind of speed are you trawling at? Or do you uh, well, that time trawling was by fluke. That was actually a Fraser. I got oh, a yeah. cobit there trawling. Yeah. yeah. But we're doing about um, five and six knots with yeah. baits. Uh, no, it's on a bait actually. Yeah. Mm. But um, yeah, so just give that a go. And what so, bait? Where, where yeah, so bait wise, um, I want to talk to you about bait too, just real quickly. Has anyone watched that YouTube thing we did on how to catch bait? Have you, anyone tried it since they've watched it? No one's watched it yet? You guys? Yeah, with that rod. Yeah, with that rod, with the interline type rod, which is uh, that rod there. Is that, that exact rod I was using on that day, actually. So this is a bait pig rod. We've just, we sell so many of these. We've only got a couple left downstairs, but we've got more coming. Thanks, Stu. Um, so that's a bait pig rod. It looks like how do you feel little fish on that, but you feel a little easy. Um, but the, the bait sack jig's actually inside of it. Okay, can see it there. So it doesn't get tangled up in your boat. There's no anger. And there's no anger. <laughs> this is like a right. There's no anger. So it just winds up inside. Thanks, Graham. Um, sinker there. And that last one's hooked up, but I'll do that in a minute. Um, so when you drop down, the secret of catching bait is when you're dropping down, guys, is if you're using an overhead or a spin, doesn't matter. If you're using a spin, run the line through your hands. But if you're in, um, say, 25 metres deep and the bait's between 15 and 20, you see a big bait ball there, big bait school. 
and you try and use colour lines so you know exactly how much lines out. So you, it goes one colour is 10 metres, the next colour, oh, there's another colour coming up, so I'm down 20 <coughs> metres, I'm in the zone. So what you need to do at that point then is, when it's, as it's going down, is you put your thumb on it and you sort of do like that through the water and keep putting your thumb on the spool like dunk, 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 down. And, it'll, and all of a sudden it'll just go loose, you think I'm on the bottom, but you're not, you've got fish on, you've, you've loaded up already. And it's time to wind it back up. If you just let the sinker shoot through the bait, um, you'll get bait when you're on the bottom, you jerk up the slack and you'll get a few, but you'll get so many more and so cl much cleaner if you do that through them. And especially with slimies, if you drop the bait jig down and jerk the slack and you get slimies in there, they just come as a big ball of six slimies wrapped up. But this way, it still can happen, but it's a lot less because you're, you're controlling it. It still has the weight of the sinker all the way on the bottom. So you start slamming it basically when I'm going through the bait school, yeah, when I'm going through the bait school, sorry. That's great. Yeah, that's true. Does that make sense? So where do you get the bait from at the moment? Um, mate, it's, you just got to look for it, Phil. It's everywhere. Um, but at the moment, um, like, the blocks is full of bait at the moment. Um, slimies and pillies. Um, the other day I went out, was it Tuesday morning, I think? I wanted to try for some sand crabs around, just at the front of the bar area there. No sand crabs, I can let you that, that, know that. Um, but um, I was, was, I put about in the afternoon and uh, it was about five o'clock, I was after work and I was late and I was trying to get out there on time, whatever. Was it Monday or it was Tuesday? Monday, Monday was it? Yeah. Monday, I can't remember. Yeah, so. I just had four pots out. I put my fourth pot out. As I put the pots out, there's all this bait around me. It's like getting dark. And I think, okay, I've got to be at home by 6.30. It's now 5.30. I always calculate time. <laughs> what have I got? Hmm, what have I got in the boat here? Oh, there's one rod. And it's, it's only a light rod. But I um, quickly just threw the bait jig out in the middle of nowhere. And the first, th that, that bait jig rod, by the way. First, it's <coughs> in my rod locker, in my little tinny. And the first string had a slimy on it and two yakkers. I thought, yeehaw, so I quickly took a bait tank on, chuck them in there. <coughs> and I dropped down again, I got three more. I thought, six, that'll do me for like 15 minutes of fishing. And then I zoomed up to the blocks, got up to the blocks, and it's like, oh, it's in the dark, all right? All these, all these, all these nav lights come on and go, oh, God, here we go. They're on every, every rock up there. So. <laughs> but I pulled out, there was no one's on one of the spots, which I like, which is really good. But within about three minutes, I had two boats come over to me. <laughs> Um, but I dropped down uh, the yakka uh, on, on a light spin rod I had. And I couldn't find any leader, 20 pound leader, that's it. And I had a live bait rig which we use a marlin, which I found on a little plastic bag in my kit. And I had a 130 pound leader, it was too heavy. It was just didn't want to know it. So I went back to the 20 pound leader, put two 70 hooks on, I cut the hooks off the other thing, put them on there, uh, 80 hooks, and I uh, dropped it down and with the slimy and straight away hooked up and it just smashed me on the bottom because there's big blocks there. And then it was time to go home. So, <laughs> and I made it home on time. Yeah. So um, there's plenty of bait at the blocks. Nice. Yep, heaps. And just out the front of the seaway. Okay. Yep, in about 15, 20 minutes deep. Where's the block? The blocks is um, the artificial reef. Do you guys don't know about the blocks? No, that says yeah, the okay. okay, sorry mate. <laughs> there's an artificial reef um, which they built about 20 years ago, 15 years ago, which is... Uh, about five k's northeast of Seaway in about 23 metres deep, 22 metres deep. Um, sometimes they put the yellow boys on them, but not in whale season, they take them back out. And they're like um, concrete tubes about the size of a bus or half a bus. <laughs> and they can swim in through them. And, and, and there holds a lot of bait, and the jewies just love it this time of year there. And you go there in the evening, and before dark, you're turning that two jew. And they're all big, they're over a metre, like a metre, 10, metre, 30, 20 kilos sort of thing. And um, if you crack it, um, you, you can get, you get your bag limit before it's even gets dark. 5.30, going back home again. You've got that five, 30 minutes fishing and you're bagged out. Yeah. Yeah. And there's about 16 blocks, I think, there or something. Some of them. They're all scattered around. They're all mate. scattered around. Yeah. But about six of them fish really good. But quite often, because everyone knows about it now, there's like, some can be three boats on one block. But if everyone's drifting, it's too if you spot like it, it can be a little bit different. But, <laughs> but if everyone's drifting and taking turns and leapfrogging, they all get a fish. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But it's quite good. Yeah. And it's not far from the seaway, but you just got to watch it come back, not on the whales, that's all. Yeah. Yeah. And we've had whales that they're splashes, like really splashes, apparently. 
another story another time. Okay, so we're going to do the draw now. <laughs> um, and just let you know, everything we talked about tonight is 30% off, guys, except for the reels, of course. Combos, let's like quickly show you. Um, that one that Stewie had before, which was the... No, oh, here, sorry. The bait rattle one. I think... Um, I think the retail on that's about... Um, we do we do deals, guys, every time we have a seminar. I think it's 129. I think they're online for about two. Let's have a look. Sorry, <laughs> 249. <laughs> Anyhow, and they've spilled up. I think they're about 400 bucks for retail, and I think it's around about uh, it's around two. I think 299 or 289 something like that for the combo, which is cheap. And then this one here um, is a Nasi, which is one of our best-selling little reels from Shimano. Nasi 5000 with the ball handle. You use a great reel for uh, micro jigging as well and slow pitch jigging. I think it's spilled up with 300 meters of 20 pound braid. 30 on that. 30 is it? Yeah. 30 pound braid. Um, it's on a squidgy um, a rod, Shimano rod, which has got K guys and stuff on it. Leader, ready to go. Um, and I think the retail on that is close to 500, and 500 bucks odd with the 300 meters of braid. And it is, um, let me get this right, guys. I think it's 299. Okay, oh, sharp hooks. <laughs> okay, that's it. And we've got no bait jig runs left. That's right, I've got worked out. <laughs> okay, besides going, oh, it's too cheap. Okay, it is too cheap. But okay, tonight, because there's so many guys here, we did, um, we bumped it up to 1600 bucks for the gear tonight. And there's nine prizes. First one's about 500, 300, 200, and it goes down from there, okay? Okay, so this is your seat number, guys. Remember your seat number? Number 13. Oh, well done. Okay. Well done, buddy. Congratulations. Good on you. Enjoy it. And it's all stuff we talked about tonight as well. Okay, hey, Misako, you're next. Yeah, you're right. You can read well. Fifteen. Eight lots of carrots. Fifteen. Well done, man. Eight lots of carrots. Well done. See, you guys asked all the questions and getting all the prizes. <laughs> um, I'll draw one out. Sorry, guys. Number thirty-one. Well done, matey. Guys, thanks for coming along. And it's so important that, that for us that you guys actually become better fishermen. Thanks, mate. Good on mate. Thank you. Um, so please, um, please watch what we do, what we teach you guys, and hopefully it helps you out. I'll show you a pick. Sorry, mate. <laughs> I was still gonna. <laughs> You put 15 back in, didn't you? Oh, I did put it back in. Sorry. <laughs> it's 15 again, but we don't normally do it. So sorry, mate. I knew you would have done that. <laughs> sorry. That's why I'm called dyslexic, Doug. Uh, 18. God, the middle there is pumping at the moment. Well done, mate. Thanks, anybody? Thanks, mate. Cheers, mate. Thank you. Okay, Misako, I'm going to let you draw this one. Okay. I think we're still around a, about 100 bucks worth or more. Oh, sorry, Stu. Uh, number eight. Oh, we're getting down. Well done, Brian. <laughs> Anybody? Congratulations, mate. Cheers, mate. Okay, uh, next one. Stu. Still got four to go. Number 10. Oh, 10. I'll pass it to... 